this is part one of canto the first of lara a tale by lord byron this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by nathan at antipodeanwriter dot wordpress dot com lara a tale by lord byron canto the first part one stanzas one to fifteen the serfs are glad through lara's wide domain and slavery half forgets her feudal chain he their unhoped but unforgotten lord the long self-exiled chieftain is restored there be bright faces in the busy hall bowls on the board and banners on the wall far chequering over the pictured window plays the unwanted faggots hospitable blaze and gay retainers gather round the hearth with tongues all loudness and with eyes all mirth the chief of lara is returned again and why had lara crossed the bounding main left by his sire too young such loss to know lord of himself that heritage of woe that fearful empire which the human breast but holds to rob the heart within of rest with none to check and few to point in time a thousand paths that slope the way to crime then when he most required commandment then had lara's daring boyhood governed men it skills not boots not step by step to trace his youth through all the mazes of its race short was the course his restlessness had run but long enough to leave him half undone and lara left in youth his fatherland but from the hour he waved his parting hand each trace waxed fainter of his course till all had nearly ceased his memory to recall his sire was dust his vassals could declare twas all they knew that lara was not there nor sent nor came he till conjecture grew cold in the many anxious in the few his hall scarce echoes with his wonted name his portrait darkens in its fading frame another chief consoled his destined bride the young forgot him and the old had died yet doth he live exclaims the impatient heir and sighs for sables which he must not wear a hundred scutcheons deck with gloomy grace the lara's last and longest dwelling-place but one is absent from the mouldering file that now were welcome in that gothic pile he comes at last in sudden loneliness and whence they know not why they need not guess they more might marvel when the greetings o'er not that he came but came not long before no train is his beyond a single page of foreign aspect and of tender age years had rolled on and fast they sped away to those that wander as to those that stay but lack of tidings from another clime had lent a flagging wing to weary time they see they recognize yet almost deem the present dubious or the past a dream he lives nor yet is past his manhood's prime though seared by toil and something touched by time his faults whatever they were if scarce forgot might be and taught him by his varied lot nor good nor ill 
of late were known his name might yet uphold his patrimonial fame his soul in youth was haughty but his sins no more than pleasure from the stripling wins and such if not yet hardened in their course might be redeemed nor ask a long remorse and they indeed were changed tis quickly seen whatever he be twas not what he had been that brow in furrowed lines had fixed at last and spake of passions but of passion past the pride but not the fire of early days coldness of mien and carelessness of praise a high demeanour and a glance that took their thoughts from others by a single look and that sarcastic levity of tongue the stinging of a heart the world hath stung that darts in seeming playfulness around and makes those feel that will not own the wound all these seemed his and something more beneath than glance could well reveal or accent breathe ambition glory love the common aim that some can conquer and that all would claim within his breast appeared no more to strive yet seemed as lately they had been alive and some deep feeling it were vain to trace at moments lightened over his livid face not much he loved long question of the past nor told of wondrous wilds and deserts vast in those far lands where he had wandered lone and as himself would have it seem unknown yet these in vain his eye could scarcely scan nor glean experience from his fellow man but what he had beheld he shunned to show as hardly worth a stranger's care to know if still more prying such inquiry grew his brow fell darker and his words more few not unrejoiced to see him once again warm was his welcome to the haunts of men born of high lineage linked in high command he mingled with the magnates of his land joined the carousals of the great and gay and saw them smile or sigh their hours away but still he only saw and did not share the common pleasure or the general care he did not follow what they all pursued with hope still baffled still to be renewed nor shadowy honour nor substantial gain nor beauty's preference and the rival's pain around him some mysterious circle thrown repelled approach and showed him still alone upon his eye sat something of reproof that kept at least frivolity aloof and things more timid that beheld him near in silence gazed or whispered mutual fear and they the wiser friendlier few confessed they deemed him better than his heir expressed twas strange in youth all action and all life burning for pleasure not averse from strife woman the field the ocean all that gave promise of gladness peril of a grave in turn he tried he ransacked all below and found his recompense in joy or woe no tame trite medium for his feelings sought in that intenseness an escape from thought the tempest of his heart in scorn had gazed on that the feebler elements hath raised the rapture of his heart had looked 
on high and asked if greater dwelt beyond the sky chained to excess the slave of each extreme how woke he from the wildness of that dream alas he told not but he did awake to curse the withered heart that would not break books for his volume heretofore was man with eye more curious he appeared to scan and oft in sudden mood for many a day from all communion he would start away and then his rarely called attendants said through night's long hours would sound his hurried tread over the dark gallery where his fathers frowned in rude but antique portraiture around they heard but whispered that must not be known the sound of words less earthly than his own yes they who choose might smile but some had seen they scarce knew what but more than should have been why gazed he so upon the ghastly head which hands profane had gathered from the dead that still beside his opened volume lay as if to startle all save him away why slept he not when others were at rest why heard no music and received no guest all was not well they deemed but where the wrong some knew perchance but twere a tale too long and such besides were too discreetly wise to more than hint their knowledge in surmise but if they would they could around the board thus lara's vessels prattled of their lord it was the night and lara's glassy stream the stars are studding each with imaged beam so calm the waters scarcely seem to stray and yet they glide like happiness away reflecting far and fairy-like from high the immortal lights that live along the sky its banks are fringed with many a goodly tree and flowers the fairest that may feast the bee such in her chaplet infant dian wove and innocence would offer to her love these deck the shore the waves their channel make in windings bright and mazy like the snake all was so still so soft in earth and air you scarce would start to meet a spirit there secure that naught of evil could delight to walk in such a scene on such a night it was a moment only for the good so lara deemed nor longer there he stood but turned in silence to his castle gate such scene his soul no more could contemplate such scene reminded him of other days of skies more cloudless moons of purer blaze of nights more soft and frequent hearts that now no no the storm may beat upon his brow unfelt unsparing but a night like this a night of beauty mocked such breast as his he turned within his solitary hall and his high shadow shot along the wall there were the painted forms of other times twas all they left of virtues or of crimes save vague tradition and the gloomy vaults that hid their dust their foibles and their faults and half a column of the pompous page that speeds the specious tale from age to age where history's pen its praise or blame supplies and lies like truth 
and still most truly lies he wandering mused and as the moonbeam shone through the dim lattice over the floor of stone and the high fretted roof and saints that there over gothic windows knelt in pictured prayer reflected in fantastic figures grew like life but not like mortal life to view his bristling locks of sable brow of gloom and the wide waving of his shaken plume glanced like a spectre's attributes and gave his aspect all that terror gives the grave twas midnight all was slumber the lone light dimmed in the lamp as loath to break the night hark there be murmurs heard in lara's hall a sound a voice a shriek a fearful call a long loud shriek and silence did they hear that frantic echo burst the sleeping ear they heard and rose and tremulously brave rush where the sound invoked their aid to save they come with half-lit tapers in their hands and snatched in startled haste unbelted brands cold as the marble where his length was laid pale as the beam that over his features played was lara stretched his half-drawn sabre near dropped it should seem in more than nature's fear yet he was firm or had been firm till now and still defiance knit his gathered brow though mixed with terror senseless as he lay there lived upon his lip the wish to slay some half-formed threat in utterance there had died some imprecation of despairing pride his eye was almost sealed but not forsook even in its trance the gladiator's look that oft awake his aspect could disclose and now was fixed in horrible repose they raise him bear him hush he breathes he speaks the swarthy blush recolours in his cheeks his lip resumes its red his eye though dim rolls wide and wild each slowly quivering limb recalls its function but his words are strung in terms that seem not of his native tongue distinct but strange enough they understand to deem them accents of another land and such they were and meant to meet an ear that hears him not alas that cannot hear his page approached and he alone appeared to know the import of the words they heard and by the changes of his cheek and brow they were not such as lara should avow nor he interpret yet with less surprise than those around their chieftain's state he eyes but lara's prostrate form he bent beside and in that tongue which seemed his own replied and lara heeds those tones that gently seem to soothe away the horrors of his dream if dream it were that thus could overthrow a breast that needed not ideal woe whenever his frenzy dreamed or i beheld if yet remembered never to be revealed rests at his heart the customed morning came and breathed new vigour in his shaken frame and solace sought he none from priest nor leech and soon the same in movement and in speech as heretofore he filled 
the passing hours nor less he smiles no more his forehead lowers then these were wont and if the coming night appeared less welcome now to lara's sight he to his marvelling vassals showed it not whose shuddering proved their fear was less forgot in trembling pairs alone they dared not crawl the astonished slaves and shun the fated hall the waving banner and the clapping door the rustling tapestry and the echoing floor the long dim shadows of surrounding trees the flapping bat the night song of the breeze ought they behold or hear their thought appalls as evening saddens over the dark grey walls end of part one recorded by nathan at antipodeanwriter.wordpress.com This is part two of Canto the First. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Nathan at antipodeanwriter.wordpress.com. Lara a Tale by Lord Byron. Canto the First, part two, stanzas sixteen to twenty nine. Vain thought that hour of never unravelled gloom came not again or lara could assume a seeming of forgetfulness that made his vassals more amazed nor less afraid had memory vanished then with sense restored since word nor look nor gesture of their lord betrayed a feeling that recalled to these that fevered moment of his mind's disease was it a dream was his the voice that spoke those strange wild accents his the cry that broke their slumber his the oppressed over-laboured heart that ceased to beat the look that made them start could he who thus had suffered so forget when such as saw that suffering shudder yet or did that silence prove his memory fixed too deep for words indelible unmixed in that corroding secrecy which gnaws the heart to show the effect but not the cause not so in him his breast had buried both nor common gazers could discern the growth of thoughts that mortal lips must leave half told they choke the feeble words that would unfold in him inexplicably mixed appeared much to be loved and hated sought and feared opinion varying over his hidden lot in praise or railing never his name forgot his silence formed a theme for others prate they guessed they gazed they fain would know his fate what had he been what was he thus unknown who walked their world his lineage only known a hater of his kind yet some would say with them he could seem gay amidst the gay but owned that smile if oft observed and near waned in its mirth and withered to a sneer that smile might reach his lip but passed not by nor ever could trace its laughter to his eye yet there was softness too in his regard at times a heart as not by nature hard but once perceived his spirit seemed to chide such weakness as unworthy of its pride and steeled itself as scorning to redeem one doubt from others half withheld esteem in self inflicted 
penance of a breast which tenderness might once have wrung from rest in vigilance of grief that would compel the soul to hate for having loved too well there was in him a vital scorn of all as if the worst had fallen which could befall he stood a stranger in this breathing world an erring spirit from another hurled a thing of dark imaginings that shaped by choice the perils he by chance escaped but scaped in vain for in their memory yet his mind would half exult and half regret with more capacity for love than earth bestows on most of mortal mould and birth his early dreams of good outstripped the truth and troubled manhood followed baffled youth with thought of years in phantom chase misspent and wasted powers for better purpose lent and fiery passions that had poured their wrath in hurried desolation over his path and left the better feelings all at strife in wild reflection over his stormy life but haughty still and loath himself to blame he called on nature's self to share the shame and charged all faults upon the fleshly form she gave to clog the soul and feast the worm till he at last confounded good and ill and half mistook for fate the acts of will too high for common selfishness he could at times resign his own for others good but not in pity not because he ought but in some strange perversity of thought that swayed him onward with a secret pride to do what few or none would do beside and this same impulse would in tempting time mislead his spirit equally to crime so much he soared beyond or sunk beneath the men with whom he felt condemned to breathe and longed by good or ill to separate himself from all who shared his mortal state his mind abhorring this had fixed her throne far from the world in regions of her own thus coldly passing all that passed below his blood in temperate seeming now would flow ah happier if it never with guilt had glowed but ever in that icy smoothness flowed tis true with other men their path he walked and like the rest in seeming did and talked nor outraged reasons rules by flaw nor start his madness was not of the head but heart and rarely wandered in his speech or drew his thoughts so forth as to offend the view with all that chilling mystery of mien and seeming gladness to remain unseen he had if twere not nature's boon an art of fixing memory on another's heart it was not love perchance nor hate nor aught that words can image to express the thought but they who saw him did not see in vain and once beheld would ask of him again and those to whom he spake remembered well and on the words however light would dwell none knew nor how nor why but he entwined himself perforce around the hearer's mind there he was stamped in liking or in hate if greeted once however brief the date 
that friendship pity or aversion knew still there within the inmost thought he grew you could not penetrate his soul but found despite your wonder to your own he wound his presence haunted still and from the breast he forced an all unwilling interest vain was the struggle in that mental net his spirit seemed to dare you to forget there is a festival where knights and dames and aught that wealth or lofty lineage claims appear a high-born and a welcome guest to otho's hall came lara with the rest the long carousal shakes the illumined hall well speeds alike the banquet and the ball and the gay dance of bounding beauty's train links grace and harmony in happiest chain blessed are the early hearts and gentle hands that mingle there in well according bands it is a sight the careful brow might smooth and make age smile and dream itself to youth and youth forget such hour was past on earth so springs the exulting bosom to that mirth and laura gazed on these sedately glad his brow belied him if his soul was sad and his glance followed fast each fluttering fair whose steps of lightness woke no echo there he leaned against the lofty pillar nigh with folded arms and long attentive eye nor marked a glance so sternly fixed on his ill-brooked high lara scrutiny like this at length he caught it tis a face unknown but seems as searching his and his alone prying and dark a stranger's by his mane who still till now had gazed on him unseen at length encountering meets the mutual gaze of keen inquiry and of mute amaze on lara's glance emotion gathering grew as if distrusting that the stranger threw along the stranger's aspect fixed and stern flashed more than thence the vulgar eye could learn tis he the stranger cried and those that heard re-echoed fast and far the whispered word tis he tis who they questioned far and near till louder accents rung on lara's ear so widely spread few bosoms well could brook the general marvel or that single look but lara stirred not changed not the surprise that sprung at first to his arrested eyes seemed now subsided neither sunk nor raised glanced his eye round though still the stranger gazed and drawing nigh exclaimed with haughty sneer tis he how came he thence what doth he hear it were too much for lara to pass by such questions so repeated fierce and high with look collected but with accent cold more mildly firm than petulantly bold he turned and met the inquisitorial tone my name is lara when thine own is known doubt not my fitting answer to requite the unlooked-for courtesy of such a knight tis lara further wouldst thou mark or ask i shun no question and i wear no mask thou shunnest no question ponder is there none thy heart must answer though thine ear would shun and deemest thou me unknown to gaze again 
at least thy memory was not given in vain oh never canst thou counsel half her debt eternity forbids thee to forget with slow and searching glance upon his face grew lara's eyes but nothing there could trace they knew or chose to know with dubious look he deigned no answer but his head he shook and half contemptuous turned to pass away but this stern stranger motioned him to stay a word i charge thee stay and answer here to one who wert thou noble were thy peer but as thou wast and art nay frown not lord if false tis easy to disprove the word but as thou wast and art on thee looks down distrusts thy smiles but shakes not at thy frown art thou not he whose deeds whatever i be words wild as these accusers like to thee i list no further those with whom they weigh may hear the rest nor venture to gainsay the wondrous tale no doubt thy tongue can tell which thus begins so courteously and well let otho cherish here his polished guest to him my thanks and thoughts shall be expressed and here their wondering host hath interposed whatever there be between you undisclosed this is no time nor fitting place to mar the mirthful meeting with a wordy war if thou sir ezelin hast aught to show which it befits count lara's ear to know to-morrow here or elsewhere as may best beseem your mutual judgment speak the rest i pledge myself for thee as not unknown though like count lara now returned alone from other lands almost a stranger grown and if from lara's blood and gentle birth i augur right of courage and of worth he will not that untainted line belie nor aught that knighthood may accord deny to-morrow be it ezelin replied and here our several worth and truth be tried i gauge my life my falchion to attest my words so may i mingle with the blest what answers lara to its centre shrunk his soul in deep abstraction sudden sunk the words of many and the eyes of all that there were gathered seemed on him to fall but his were silent his appeared to stray in far forgetfulness away away alas that heedlessness of all around bespoke remembrance only too profound to-morrow ay to-morrow further word than those repeated none from lara heard upon his brow no outward passion spoke from his large eye no flashing anger broke yet there was something fixed in that low tone which showed resolve determined though unknown he seized his cloak his head he slightly bowed and passing ezelin he left the crowd and as he passed him smiling met the frown with which that chieftain's brow would bear him down it was nor smile of mirth nor struggling pride that curbs to scorn the wrath it cannot hide but that of one in his own heart secure of all that he would do or could endure could this mean peace the calmness of the good or guilt grown old in desperate hardihood alas too like in confidence are each 
for man to trust to mortal look or speech from deeds and deeds alone may he discern truths which it wrings the unpractised heart to learn and lara called his page and went his way well could that stripling word or sign obey his only follower from those climes afar where the soul glows beneath a brighter star for lara left the shore from whence he sprung in duty patient and sedate though young silent as him he served his faith appears above his station and beyond his years though not unknown the tongue of lara's land in such from him he rarely heard command but fleet his step and clear his tones would come when lara's lip breathed forth the words of home those accents as his native mountains dear awake their absent echoes in his ear friends kindreds parents wanted voice recall now lost abjured for one his friend his all for him earth now disclosed no other guide what marvel then he rarely left his side light was his form and darkly delicate that brow whereon his native son had sate but had not marred though in his beams he grew the cheek where oft the unbidden blush shone through yet not such blush as mounts when health would show all the heart's hue in that delighted glow but twas a hectic tint of secret care that for a burning moment fevered there and the wild sparkle of his eye seemed caught from high and lightened with electric thought though its black orb those long low lashes fringe had tempered with a melancholy tinge yet less of sorrow than of pride was there or twere grief a grief that none should share and pleased not him the sports that please his age the tricks of youth the frolics of the page for hours on lara he would fix his glance as all forgotten in that watchful trance and from his chief withdrawn he wandered lone brief were his answers and his questions none his walk the wood his sport some foreign book his resting place the bank that curbs the brook he seemed like him he served to live apart from all that lures the eye and fills the heart to know no brotherhood and take from earth no gift beyond that bitter boon our birth if aught he loved twas lara that twas shown his faith in reverence and in deeds alone in mute attention and his care which guessed each wish fulfilled it ere the tongue expressed still there was haughtiness in all he did a spirit deep that brooked not to be chid his zeal though more than that of servile hands in act alone obeys his air commands as if twas lara's less than his desire that thus he served but surely not for hire slight were the tasks enjoined him by his lord to hold the stirrup or to bear the sword to tune his lute or if he willed it more on tombs of other times and tongues to pour but never to mingle with the menial train to whom he showed nor deference nor disdain 
but that well-worn reserve which proved he knew no sympathy with that familiar crew his soul whatever his station or his stem could bow to lara not descend to them of higher birth he seemed and better days nor mark of vulgar toil that hand betrays so femininely white it might bespeak another sex when matched with that smooth cheek but for his garb and something in his gaze more wild and high than woman's eye betrays a latent fierceness that far more became his fiery climate than his tender frame true in his words it broke not from his breast but from his aspect might be more than guessed caled his name for rumour said he bore another ere he left his mountain shore for sometimes he would hear however nigh that name repeated loud without reply as unfamiliar or if roused again start to the sound as but remembered then unless twas lara's wonted voice that spake for then ear eyes and heart would all awake he had looked down upon the festive hall and marked that sudden strife so marked of all and when the crowd around and near him told their wonder at the calmness of the bold their marvel how the high-born lara bore such insult from a stranger doubly sore the colour of young caled went and came the lip of ashes and the cheek of flame and over his brow the dampening heart drops through the sickening iciness of that cold dew that rises as the busy bosom sinks with heavy thoughts from which reflection shrinks yes there be things which we must dream and dare and execute ere thought be half aware whatever might caled's be it was e now to seal his lip but agonize his brow he gazed on ezelin till lara cast that sidelong smile upon the night he passed when caled saw that smile his visage fell as if on something recognized right well his memory read in such a meaning more than lara's aspect unto others wore forward he sprung a moment both were gone and all within that hall seemed left alone each had so fixed his eye on lara's mien all had so mixed their feelings with that scene that when his long dark shadow through the porch no more relieves the glare of yon high torch each pulse beats quicker and all bosoms seem to bound as doubting from too black a dream such as we know is false yet dread in sooth because the worst is ever nearest truth and they are gone but ezelin is there with thoughtful visage and imperious air but long remained not ere an hour expired he waved his hand to otho and retired the crowd are gone the revellers at rest the courteous host and all approving guest again to that accustomed couch must creep where joy subsides and sorrow sighs to sleep and man overlaboured with his being's strife shrinks to that sweet forgetfulness 
of life there lie love's feverish hope and cunning's guile hate's working brain and lulled ambitions while over each vain eye oblivion's pinions wave and quenched existence crouches in a grave what better name may slumber's bed become night's sepulture the universal home where weakness strength vice virtue sunk supine alike in naked helplessness recline glad for a while to heave unconscious breath yet wake to wrestle with the dread of death and shun though day but dawn on ills increased that sleep the loveliest since it dreams the least end of part two end of canto the first recorded by nathan at antipodean writer dot wordpress dot com this is part one of canto the second this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by nathan at antipodean writer dot wordpress dot com lara a tale by lord byron canto the second part one stanzas one to fifteen night wanes the vapours round the mountains curled melt into morn and light awakes the world man has another day to swell the past and lead him near to little but his last but mighty nature bounds as from her birth the sun is in the heavens and life on earth flowers in the valley splendour in the beam health on the gale and freshness in the stream immortal man behold her glories shine and cry exulting inly they are thine gaze on while yet thy gladdened eye may see a morrow comes when they are not for thee and grieve what may above thy senseless bier nor earth nor sky will yield a single tear nor cloud shall gather more nor leaf shall fall nor gale breathe forth one sigh for thee for all but creeping things shall revel in their spoil and fit thy clay to fertilize the soil tis morn tis noon assembled in the hall the gathered chieftains come to otho's call tis now the promised hour that must proclaim the life or death of lara's future fame and ezelin his charge may here unfold and whatsoever the tale it must be told his faith was pledged and lara's promise given to meet it in the eye of man and heaven why comes he not such truths to be divulged methinks the accuser's rest is long indulged the hour is past and lara too is there with self-confiding coldly patient air why comes not ezelin the hour is past and murmurs rise and otho's brows overcast i know my friend his faith i cannot fear if yet he be on earth expect him here the ruth that held him in the valley stands between my own and noble lara's lands my halls from such a guest had honour gained nor had sir ezelin his host disdained but that some previous proof forbade his stay and urged him to prepare against to-day the word i pledged for his i pledge again or will myself redeem his knighthood's stain he ceased and lara answered i am here to lend at thy demand a listening ear to tales of evil from a stranger's tongue whose words already might my heart have wrung but that i deemed him scarcely less than mad or at the worst a foe ignobly bad i know him not but me it seems he knew in lands where 
but i must not trifle too produce this babbler or redeem the pledge here in thy hold and with thy falchion's edge proud otho on the instant reddening threw his glove on earth and forth his sabre flew the last alternative befits me best and thus i answer for mine absent guest with cheek unchanging from its sallow gloom however near his own or other's tomb with hand whose almost careless coolness spoke its grasp well used to deal the sabre stroke with eye though calm determined not to spare did lara to his willing weapon bear in vain the circling chieftains round them closed for otho's frenzy would not be opposed and from his lip those words of insult fell his sword is good who can maintain them well short was the conflict furious blindly rash vain otho gave his bosom to the gash he bled and fell but not with deadly wound stretched by a dexterous slight along the ground demand thy life he answered not and then from that red floor he never had risen again for lara's brow upon the moment grew almost to blackness in its demon hue and fiercer shook his angry falchion now than when his foes was levelled at his brow then all was stern collectedness and art now rose the unleavened hatred of his heart so little sparing to the foe he felled that when the approaching crowd his arm withheld he almost turned the thirsty point on those who thus for mercy dared to interpose but to a moment's thought that purpose bent yet looked he on him still with eye intent as if he loathed the ineffectual strife that left a foe however overthrown with life as if to search how far the wound he gave had sent its victim onward to his grave they raised the bleeding otho and the leech forbade all present question sign and speech the others met within a neighbouring hall and he incensed and heedless of them all the cause and conqueror in this sudden fray in haughty silence slowly strode away he backed his steed his homeward path he took nor cast on otho's towers a single look but where was he that meteor of a night who menaced but to disappear with light where was this Esselin, who came and went to leave no other trace of his intent he left the dome of otho long ere morn in darkness yet so well the path was worn he could not miss it near his dwelling lay but there he was not and with coming day came fast in query which unfolded nought except the absence of the chief it sought a chamber tenantless a steed at rest his host alarmed his murmuring squires distressed their search extends along around the path in dread to meet the marks of prowlers wrath but none are there and not a break hath borne nor gout of blood nor shred of mantle torn nor fall nor struggle hath defaced the grass which still retains a mark where murder was nor dabbling fingers left to tell the tale the bitter print of each convulsive nail when agonized hands that cease to guard wound in that pang the smoothness of the sward some such had been if here a life was reft but these were not and doubting hope is left and strange suspicion whispering lara's name now daily mutters over his blackened fame then sudden silent when his form appeared awaits the absence of the thing it feared 
again its wonted wandering to renew and die conjecture with a darker hue days roll along and otho's wounds are healed but not his pride and hate no more concealed he was a man of power and lara's foe the friend of all who sought to work him woe and from his country's justice now demands account of ezelin at lara's hands who else than lara could have cause to fear his presence who had made him disappear if not the man on whom his menaced charge had sate too deeply were he left at large the general rumour ignorantly loud the mystery dearest to the curious crowd the seeming friendliness of him who strove to win no confidence and wake no love the sweeping fierceness which his soul betrayed the skill with which he wielded his keen blade where had his arm unwarlike caught that art where had that fierceness grown upon his heart for it was not the blind capricious rage a word can kindle and a word a sage but the deep working of a soul unmixed with aught of pity where its wrath had fixed such as long power and overgorged success concentrates into all that's merciless these linked with that desire which ever sways mankind the rather to condemn than praise gainst lara gathering raised at length a storm such as himself might fear and foes would form and he must answer for the absent head of one that haunts him still alive or dead within that land was many a malcontent who cursed the tyranny to which he bent that soil full many a ringing despot saw who worked his wantonness in form of law long war without and frequent broil within had made a path for blood and giant sin that waited but a signal to begin new havoc such as civil discord blends which knows no neuter owns but foes or friends fixed in his feudal fortress each was lord in word and deed obeyed in soul abhorred thus lara had inherited his lands and with them pining hearts and sluggish hands but that long absence from his native clime had left him stainless of oppression's crime and now diverted by his milder sway all dread by slow degrees had worn away the menials felt their usual awe alone but more for him than them that fear was grown they deemed him now unhappy though at first their evil judgment augured of the worst and each long restless night and silent mood was traced to sickness fed by solitude and though his lonely habits threw of late gloom over his chamber cheerful was his gait for thence the wretched never unsoothed withdrew for them at least his sole compassion knew cold to the great contemptuous to the high the humble passed not his unheeding eye much he would speak not but beneath his roof they found asylum oft and never reproof and they who watched might mark that day by day some new retainers gathered to his sway but most of late since ezelin was lost he played the courteous lord and bounteous host perchance his strife with otho made him dread some snare prepared for his obnoxious head whatever his view his favour more obtains with these the people than his fellow thanes if this were policy so far twas sound the million judged but of him as they found 
from him by sterner chiefs to exile driven they but required a shelter and twas given by him no peasant mourned his rifled cot and scarce the serf could murmur over his lot with him old avarice found its hoard secure with him contempt forbore to mock the poor youth present cheer and promised recompense detained till all too late to part from thence to hate he offered with the coming change the deep reversion of delayed revenge to love long baffled by the unequal match the well-won charms success was sure to snatch all now was ripe he waits but to proclaim that slavery nothing which was still a name the moment came the hour when otho thought secure at last the vengeance which he sought his summons found the destined criminal begirt by thousands in his swarming hall fresh from their feudal fetters newly riven defying earth and confident of heaven that morning he had freed the soil-bound slaves who dig no land for tyrants but their graves such is their cry some watchword for the fight must vindicate the wrong and warp the right religion freedom vengeance what you will a word's enough to raise mankind to kill some factious phrase by cunning caught and spread that guilt may reign and wolves and worms be fed throughout that clime the feudal chiefs had gained such sway their infant monarch hardly reigned now was the hour for faction's rebel growth the serfs contemned the one and hated both they waited but a leader and they found one to their cause inseparably bound by circumstance compelled to plunge again in self-defence amidst the strife of men cut off by some mysterious fate from those whom birth and nature meant not for his foes had lara from that night to him accursed prepared to meet but not alone the worst some reason urged whatever it was to shun inquiry into deeds at distance done by mingling with his own the cause of all even if he failed he still delayed his fall the sullen calm that long his bosom kept the storm that once had spent itself and slept roused by events that seemed foredoomed to urge his gloomy fortunes to their utmost verge burst forth and made him all he once had been and is again he only changed the scene light care had he for life and less for fame but not less fitted for the desperate game he deemed himself marked out for others hate and mocked at ruin so they shared his fate and cared he for the freedom of the crowd he raised the humble butt to bend the proud he had hoped quiet in his sullen lair but man and destiny beset him there inured to hunters he was found at bay and they must kill they cannot snare the prey stern unambitious silent he had been henceforth a calm spectator of life's scene but dragged again upon the arena stood a leader not unequal to the feud in voice mien gesture savage nature spoke and from his eye the gladiator broke what boots the oft repeated tale of strife the feast of vultures and the waste of life the varying fortune of each separate field the fierce that vanquish and the faint that yield the smoking ruin and the crumbled wall in this the struggle was the same with all save that distempered passions lent their force in bitterness that banished all remorse none sued for mercy knew her cry was vain 
the captive died upon the battle plain in either cause one rage alone possessed the empire of the alternate victor's breast and they that smote for freedom or for sway deemed few were slain while more remained to slay it was too late to check the wasting brand and desolation reaped the famished land the torch was lighted and the flame was spread and carnage smiled upon her daily dead fresh with the nerve the new-born impulse strung the first success to lara's numbers clung but that vain victory hath ruined all they form no longer to their leader's call in blind confusion on the foe they press and think to snatch is to secure success the lust of booty and the thirst of hate lure on the broken brigands to their fate in vain he doth whatever a chief may do to check the headlong fury of that crew in vain their stubborn ardour he would tame the hand that kindles cannot quench the flame the wary foe alone hath turned their mood and shown their rashness to that erring brood the feigned retreat the nightly ambuscade the daily harass and the fight delayed the long privation of the hoped supply the tentless rest beneath the humid sky the stubborn wall that mocks the leaguer's art and palls the patience of his baffled heart of these they had not deemed the battle day they could encounter as a veteran may but more preferred the fury of the strife and present death to hourly suffering life and famine rings and fever sweeps away his numbers melting fast from their array intemperate triumph fades to discontent and lara's soul alone seems still unbent but few remain to aid his voice and hand and thousands dwindled to a scanty band desperate though few the last and best remained to mourn the discipline they late disdained one hope survives the frontier is not far and thence they may escape from native war and bear within them to the neighbouring state an exile's sorrows or an outlaw's hate hard is the task their fatherland to quit but harder still to perish or submit it is resolved they march consenting night guides with her star their dim and torchless flight already they perceive its tranquil beam sleep on the surface of the barrier stream already they descry is yon the bank away tis lined with many a hostile rank return or fly what glitters in the rear tis otho's banner the pursuer's spear are those the shepherd's fires upon the height alas they blaze too widely for the flight cut off from hope and compassed in the toil less blood perchance hath bought a richer spoil a moment's pause tis but to breathe their band or shall they onward press or here withstand it matters little if they charge the foes who by the border stream their march oppose some few perchance may break and pass the line however linked to baffle such design the charge be ours to wait for their assault were fate well worthy of a coward's halt forth flies each sabre reined is every steed and the next word shall scarce outstrip the deed in the next tone of lara's gathering breath how many shall but hear the voice of death his blade is barred in him there is an air as deep but far too tranquil for despair a something of indifference more than then becomes the bravest if they feel for men he turned his eye on khaled ever near and still too faithful 
to betray one fear perchance twas but the moon's dim twilight through along his aspect an unwonted hue of mournful paleness whose deep tint expressed the truth and not the terror of his breast this lara marked and laid his hand on his it trembled not in such an hour as this his lip was silent scarcely beat his heart his eye alone proclaimed we will not part thy band may perish or thy friends may flee farewell to life but not adieu to thee the word hath passed his lips and onward driven pours the linked band through ranks asunder riven well has each steed obeyed the armoured heel and flash the scimitars and rings the steel outnumbered but not outbraved they still oppose despair to daring and affront to foes and blood is mingled with the dashing stream which runs all redly till the morning beam commanding aiding animating all where foe appeared to press or friend to fall cheers lara's voice and waves or strikes his steel inspiring hope himself had ceased to feel none fled for well they knew that flight were vain but those that waver turn to smite again while yet they find the firmest of the foe recoil before their leaders look and blow now girt with numbers now almost alone he foils their ranks or reunites his own himself he spared not once they seemed to fly now was the time he waved his hand on high and shook why sudden droops that plumed crest the shaft is sped the arrows in his breast that fatal gesture left the unguarded side and death has stricken down yon arm of pride the word of triumph fainted from his tongue that hand so raised how droopingly it hung but yet the sword instinctively retains though from its fellow shrink the falling reins these caled snatches dizzy with the blow and senseless bending over his saddle-bow perceives not lara that his anxious page beguiles his charger from the combat's rage meantime his followers charge and charge again to mix the slayers now to heed the slain End of part one. Recorded by Nathan at antipodeanwriter.wordpress.com. This is part two of Canto the Second. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Nathan at antipodeanwriter.wordpress.com. Lara, a tale by Lord Byron canto the second part two stanzas sixteen to twenty five day glimmers on the dying and the dead the cloven cuirass and the helmless head the war-horse masterless is on the earth and that lask gasp hath burst his bloody girth and near yet quivering with what life remained the heel that urged him and the hand that reigned and some too near that rolling torrent lie whose waters mock the lip of those that die that panting thirst which scorches in the breath of those that die the soldier's fiery death in vain impels the burning mouth to crave one drop the last to cool it for the grave with feeble and convulsive effort swept their limbs along the crimsoned turf have crept the faint remains of life such struggles waste but yet they reach the stream and bend to taste they feel its freshness and almost partake 
why pause no further thirst have they to slake it is unquenched and yet they feel it not it was an agony but now forgot beneath a lime remoter from the scene where but for him that strife had never been a breathing but devoted warrior lay twas lara bleeding fast from life away his follower once and now his only guide kneels kled watchful over his welling side and with his scarf would staunch the tides that rush with each convulsion in a blacker gush and then as his faint breathing waxes low in feebler not less fatal tricklings flow he scarce can speak but motions him tis vain and merely adds another throb to pain he clasps the hand that pang which would assage and sadly smiles his thanks to that dark page who nothing fears nor feels nor heeds nor sees save that damp brow which rests upon his knees save that pale aspect where the eye though dim held all the light that shone on earth for him the foe arrives who long had searched the field their triumph naught till lara too should yield they would remove him but they see twere vain and he regards them with a calm disdain that rose to reconcile him with his fate and that escape to death from living hate and otho comes and leaping from his steed looks on the bleeding foe that made him bleed and questions of his state he answers not scarce glances on him as on one forgot and turns to Khaled, each remaining word they understood not if distinctly heard his dying tones are in that other tongue to which some strange remembrance wildly clung they spake of other scenes but what is known to Khaled, whom their meaning reached alone and he replied though faintly to their sound while gazed the rest in dumb amazement round they seemed even then that twain unto the last to half forget the present in the past to share between themselves some separate fate whose darkness none beside should penetrate their words though faint were many from the tone their import those who heard could judge alone from this you might have deemed young caled's death more near than lara's by his voice and breath so sad so deep and hesitating broke the accents his scarce moving pale lips spoke but lara's voice though low at first was clear and calm till murmuring death gasped hoarsely near but from his visage little could we guess so unrepentant dark and passionless save that when struggling nearer to his last upon that page his eye was kindly cast and once as caled's answering accents ceased rose lara's hand and pointed to the east whether as then the breaking sun from high rolled back the clouds the morrow caught his eye or that twas chance or some remembered scene that raised his arm to point where such had been scarce caled seemed to know but turned away as if his heart abhorred that coming day and shrunk his glance before that morning light to look on lara's brow where all grew night yet sense seemed left though better were its loss for when one near displayed the absolving cross and proffered to his touch the holy bead of which his parting soul might own the need he looked upon it with an eye profane and smiled heaven pardon if twere with disdain and caled 
though he spoke not nor withdrew from lara's face his fixed despairing view with brow repulsive and with gesture swift flung back the hand which held the sacred gift as if such but disturbed the expiring man nor seemed to know his life but then began that life of immortality secure to none save them whose faith in christ is sure but gasping heaved the breath that lara drew and dull the film along his dim eye grew his limbs stretched fluttering and his head drooped o'er the weak yet still untiring knee that bore he pressed the hand he held upon his heart it beats no more but caled will not part with the cold grasp but feels and feels in vain for that faint throb which answers not again it beats away thou dreamer he is gone it once was lara which thou lookest upon he gazed as if not yet had passed away the haughty spirit of that humbled clay and those around have roused him from his trance but cannot tear from thence his fixed glance and when in raising him from where he bore within his arms the form that felt no more he saw the head his breast would still sustain roll down like earth to earth upon the plain he did not dash himself thereby nor tear the glossy tendrils of his raven hair but strove to stand and gaze but reeled and fell scarce breathing more than that he loved so well than that he loved oh never yet beneath the breast of man such trusty love may breathe that trying moment hath at once revealed the secret long and yet but half concealed in bearing to revive that lifeless breast its grief seemed ended but the sex confessed and life returned and caled felt no shame what now to her was womanhood or fame and lara sleeps not where his father's sleep but where he died his grave was dug as deep nor is his mortal slumber less profound though priest nor blessed nor marble decked the mound and he was mourned by one whose quiet grief less loud outlasts a people's for their chief vain was all question asked her of the past and vain even minutes silent to the last she told nor whence nor why she left behind her all for one who seemed but little kind why did she love him curious fool be still is human love the growth of human will to her he might be gentleness the stern have deeper thoughts than your dull eyes discern and when they love your smilers guess not how beats the strong heart though less the lips avow they were not common links that formed the chain that bound to lara caled's heart and brain but that wild tale she brooked not to unfold and sealed is now each lip that could have told they laid him in the earth and on his breast besides the wound that sent his soul to rest they found the scattered dints of many a scar which were not planted there in recent war wherever had passed his summer years of life it seems they vanished in a land of strife but all unknown his glory or his guilt these only told that somewhere blood was spilt and ezelin who might have spoke the past returned no more that night appeared his last upon that night a peasant's is the tale a serf that crossed the intervening vale when cynthia's light almost gave way to morn and nearly veiled in mist her waning horn 
a serf that rose betimes to thread the wood and hugh the bough that bought his children's food passed by the river that divides the plain of otho's lands and lara's broad domain he heard a tramp a horse and horseman broke from out the wood before him was a cloak wrapped round some burthen at his saddle-bow bent was his head and hidden was his brow roused by the sudden sight at such a time and some foreboding that it might be crime himself unheeded watched the stranger's course who reached the river bounded from his horse and lifting thence the burthen which he bore heaved up the bank and dashed it from the shore then paused and looked and turned and seemed to watch and still another hurried glance would snatch and follow with his step the stream that flowed as if even yet too much its surface showed at once he started stooped around him strown the winter floods had scattered heaps of stone of these the heaviest thence he gathered there and slung them with a more than common care meantime the serf had crept to where unseen himself might safely mark what this might mean he caught a glimpse as of a floating breast and something glittered starlight on the vest but ere he well could mark the buoyant trunk a massy fragment smote it and it sunk it rose again but indistinct to view and left the waters of a purple hue then deeply disappeared the horseman gazed till ebbed the latest eddy it had raised then turning vaulted on his pouring steed and instant spurred him into panting speed his face was masked the features of the dead if dead it were escaped the observer's dread but if in sooth a star its bosom bore such is the badge that knighthood ever wore and such tis known sir ezelin had worn upon the night that led to such a morn if thus he perished heaven receive his soul his undiscovered limbs to ocean roll and charity upon the hope would dwell it was not lara's hand by which he fell and caled lara ezelin are gone alike without their monumental stone the first all efforts vainly strove to wean from lingering where her chieftain's blood had been grief had so tamed a spirit once too proud her tears were few her wailing never loud but furious would you tear her from the spot where yet she scarce believed that he was not her eye shot forth with all the living fire that haunts the tigress in her whelpless ire but left to waste her weary moments there she talked all idly unto shapes of air such as the busy brain of sorrow paints and woos to listen to her fond complaints and she would sit beneath the very tree where lay his drooping head upon her knee and in that posture where she saw him fall his words his looks his dying grasp recall and she had shorn but saved her raven hair and oft would snatch it from her bosom there and fold and press it gently to the ground as if she staunched anew some phantom's wound herself would question and for him reply then rising start and beckon him to fly from some imagined spectre in pursuit then seat her down upon some linden's root and hide her visage with her meagre hand or trace strange characters upon the sand this could not last she lies by him she loved her tale untold her truth too dearly proved end of part two end of canto the second end of lara a tale by lord byron recorded by nathan at antipodeanwriter dot wordpress dot com